There we are. Okay, hey, let's now start. we're live. <laughs> now we're live. Technical glitch for the first minute. Um, hi, I'm Chris. And I'm Cherie, and we are Technomadia. And we're going to do our intro again because we just did it to the void. So, how long have we been doing this? <laughs> so, we have been full time RVers since 2006. And now we split our time also on a cruising motor yacht. Which is where we are right now. We're dividing our year between RV in the winter and boat in the summer and however they overlap. And uh, we have no intentions to stop doing this anytime soon. And uh, good, people are seeing us and hearing <laughs> us. Yay. <laughs> so one of the comments that we have gotten over the years, and if you're an RVer or you're a boater or you're gearing up for either of those, a lot of people will probably be asking you, it's like, how can you afford to put fuel in that thing? And it's, it's like people will even walk up to you while you're filling and be like, I'd hit the road. I'd live. I'd, I'd love to live on the road, but I could never afford fuel. Fuel is just too expensive. How do you, you know, that thing's got must have horrible economy and people start dissing your, your rig or, or your boat. And, uh, and I think for a perspective, of a lot of people is they're thinking about if they still own a home and are living in a home and they bought an RV or a boat for recreational vacation style usage. And then they're thinking about the fuel costs on top of their living expenses. And they're thinking of the fuel costs from the perspective of trying to cram in a huge trip into their quick vacation weekend. So yeah, indeed. If or, you're doing an ex or an extended vacation. Yeah, or an extended, yeah. So, but if you're doing an RV for a vacation, Fuel is a huge part of that vacation trip usually, but when you're living in an RV and you don't have a separate home, it it's actually different. balances out very differently. So that's what we're going to talk about in this video broadcast. This is actually an adaptation of a blog post that we did back in 2012, which I'm going to rewrite to go along with this video, <laughs> but you can bring that up. It's at technomadia.com slash fuel costs. And uh, you can read the old version, and that one is very RV-centric, so I'm, I will update that. Yes. And that link will go to the new one when it is ready. But we're going to be talking about how the title of this video is we look at fuel more like pouring rent into the tank mm -hmm. than we do as a transportation cost. And w when you think of it that way, it, it balances out so nicely because you have more control. And I guess we'll dive into the, yeah. the little elements of that. Okay. Yeah. So first one is just looking at fuel as part of your housing costs now, not as transportation costs. Right. And we actually kind of think of both our RV or marina slip fees and campground fees and fuel as one budget item. It's not really two separate things. We track them separately, but really think of them together. Right. So when we lived in a six and bricks house, we had rent. Chris had rent. I had a mortgage on my house. Yep. And that was what now campground fees plus fuel costs now is what we consider that old budget line going towards. Right. So why don't you bring up the slide that I created for this one? Okay, hopefully it goes sideways. There we are. There we go. So there's an example of both our RV typical expenses and our boat expenses, and these are on a monthly basis. Uh, you can do a full cost log of ours. We have shared our, our costs of both the boating and the RVing on a monthly basis since Oh, 2009. But in our RV and bus, I would say our typical RV campground fees are about $600 a month. That varies a lot throughout the year, of course, based upon what we're doing. And our fuel is somewhere around $260 a month. So our rent when we're RVing is around 860 bucks a month. And that, God, that's so cheap compared to what I used to pay in San Francisco. <laughs> and that was 12 years ago, what it would be now. Oh, oh my yeah. gosh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, keep in mind, we're not just going to RV parks and things like that. We're staying in places that would have million dollar views. And some months it can be a lot cheaper because we choose to boondock. Um, so that's just an average. Actually, I say that's a very high average if you go back and look at our monthly expenses. I would mm. say we're more around four or $500. Right. It's hard to give you, this is a, you know, a waving thing. Yeah. In the boat, we've had the boat now going on a year, year and, and a half. half. Yep. Um, our dockage fees are what we're paying to stay at a marina uh, and factoring and averaging in anchored out nights and mooring nights, which are the freer and cheaper options. We seem to be averaging about $800 a month. So yes, it has been more expensive than the bus, but we're traveling differently as right. well. And our fuel so far has actually been cheaper than yeah. Despite our fuel economy being vastly worse in the boat than in the bus, fuel's cheaper just because of the pace of travel. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Okay, so do you want to switch the slides to the next one here? Yes, yes. Okay. The next one is talking number two about why fuel isn't that big of a deal. Okay. 
If you look at your overall monthly costs, now your fuel expenses are probably going to be different than ours. It's all based upon how much you're traveling and your expenses are going to be di different. But this is kind of an average of our costs over the last 10 plus years since we've been tracking it at a detailed level. Um, you know, our campground and docking fees are $600, $800 a month. Our food budget, we typically spend around 1000 We eat out. We consider yeah. dining out to be part of the travel experience. Yeah. Um, insurance and uh, registration on both the RV and boat runs us about $329 a month when you break it out. Uh, our internet service is around $200 a month, and that includes cellular phones. And we have all four carriers. Uh, and then maintenance, we budget about $1,500 a month, and that's both for the boat, which is the majority of that cost. Right now. Uh, sure. And the RV, uh, we actually, $1,500 is more like our annual. <laughs> but you look at that fuel amongst all those other things is actually a really small line item in our budget. And that, that is something that somebody who hasn't been doing this and hasn't been tracking their expenses on the road would, they, so many people who are thinking about doing this think fuel is going to be one of the biggest line items they have to worry about. <laughs> and I see someone commented they don't see wine in the budget. That's kind of wrapped up in that food category. Yeah, we could put, start tracking that separately, we but we probably don't want to. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to see that number. Okay. <laughs> all right, next slide is... The, um, this one is also kind of showing over the years what our average fuel costs have been uh, since we've been tracking them. And you can see they do vary, and that's you know, variation both on what the current prices are as well as how many miles we're traveling. Um, so you can see that's where I got my averages from. Um, this year, of course, is not complete, and I'm kind of projecting our anticipated travels through the end of the year to get 2018s, but that's about where we're at. So, right. where are we here? You are in control of how much you use. Right. Is there a slide for this? Or we just I don't talk? remember. Okay. Let's see what I... the next slide was. Fuel uh, economy. Yes. yes. Okay. okay, yes, here we are. All right, so point number three about fuel as a full-timer is when you start to look at fuel costs as part of your housing expenses, suddenly it starts to look very interesting when you own a house or, a, or you're renting something. Your, fit, your costs are pretty much fixed. You can't watch less TV and have your cable bill go down. It doesn't work that way. But you, you can't live in your house less and have your mortgage payment go down. Your mortgage right. company yeah. and your or your landlord don't care that you've only in the house for 20 days I out guess, of the year, of the you, month. I guess I guess you can start <laughs> sleeping on the couch and Airbnb in your bedroom. I mean, there yeah. is that. But, <laughs> but when you're on the road, you control your pace of travel and the places you travel. And that's a flexibility that people in fixed locations really do not have. So, you have choice in how much you're spending on your marina or campground fees based upon where you're staying or if you're anchoring out or boondocking and doing the free options. And how much amenities you want and all that stuff. You can dial it up and down, particularly if you've got a variable budget, a variable income. You can uh, have a lot more control to have your expenses match your income. Um, and then you can control the fuel portion of that line item by how much you're driving. Right. So in our RV and bus, our fuel economy, and of course you put that in quotes, I mean, there's nothing economical about the fuel burn rate. It's definitely not a Prius. <laughs> and we both used to have Priuses and you know we kind of miss our 50 mile gallon days. <laughs> um, but you know, our RV, uh, we get about seven to seven and a half miles per gallon. The boat, it's somewhere around one and a half to two. We haven't actually used enough fuel to get accurate numbers, but that's what we're going based on. Mm -hmm. When we're traveling in the bus, we usually travel 55 to 60 miles per hour. In the boat, seven to eight knots. <laughs> Much lower. And I kind of wish they let you travel that slow in a bus. It'd be great for the scenery. You can. They tend to pull you over. Yeah, though. they'll start honking at you on the highway. Um. Mm -hmm. And our driving days are very different. Um, RV and bus, we, we it's not abnormal for us to cover 50 to 200 miles in a day. Yeah. And on the boat, um, we, we've actually been have several days where we go like six nautical miles. We you know, barely move. And other days, I think our longest so far is 30, 40, 40 42. We, we hit 42. And, you know, that's that's a long day on a boat. And you know, we're, we're not in any hurry to go far. And Basically, past. what you see there is on our repositioning day, we try to keep it under four hours of driving time. And that's what it comes out to. Now, how does that relate annually? Uh, in the RV bus, we found if we're RVing full time through the year, uh, 5,000 to 7,500 miles in a year is about what's comfortable for us. 
in the boat, and we're finding 500 miles when you factor in staying places. Mm-hmm. And it's not just about saving fuel for us. It's no, about it's maximizing just, our time. In more, yeah, more time. Go. I mean, there, there are a lot of people, and there's a lot of good reasons for people to, to do the loop, you know, all 6,000 miles of it. That's their year. Either they've only got a year to do it, or they're following the seasons. And But that definitely changes your fuel calculations and how big of a percentage the fuel will be of your budget. For us, that we're, we're sloopers. We're slow loopers. <laughs> slow cruisers too yes. um, but that's what works for us and of course you can adjust those numbers for yourself all right i think now we go to full video because i don't have slides okay, for that no slide. Bing. hey there we are hey. um so point number four is when you we already kind of touched on is you have control over how many miles you travel in a year or a month mm-hmm. or a week depending upon how you have your budget set up um is also keep in mind that when fuel costs fluctuate, you know, the, the price per gallon that you're paying, which can change for a variety of reasons, mm-hmm. um, you have control on how you adapt to that. Do you just increase your budget or do you slow down the number of miles that you're going in that in a time to yeah. adjust to the new costs? Yeah. Yeah. Back back when I was in my commuting days, if fuel were to go up in price, I couldn't decide to go to work less. And I still had my 80 miles a day of driving. And fortunately, I did have a Prius. But um, fuel was a much more significant factor in that. Though, so if you are, you know, have commitments um, and things that you have to drive to for your work, for medical, for taking care of somebody, um, those are costs that you have to absorb when the fuel prices fluctuate. As a full-time recreational RV or, or cruiser, you can just say, That's, yeah. "Prices go up. You know what? I'm going to go find myself a really nice place to stay put for a while yeah. and." wait it out or not pay those costs or, or build so. build restock the cruising kitty or the the rv kitty mm-hmm. and you know just you know get, get that monthly spot and if you don't drive anywhere for a month your fuel bill is going to be low <laughs> yeah um number five another uh point for us full-timers to keep in mind is we have a lot more options for saving money on fuel while we're travelers than we did when we were stationary right so one of the really big basics is fuel costs can vary dramatically from place to place, particularly not just from station to station, but from state to state because the taxes vary so much state to state. So if you could factor that into your travels, um, plan, you know, fill the tank, particularly if you've got big tanks, fill them before you cross into the more expensive states, you can save a ton of money. And how can you know beforehand? <laughs> uh, we actually wrote an app for that, uh, State Lines. It's available on iOS and Android. Uh, does track the state fuel uh, taxes that you pay. So mm-hmm. you kind of research that in advance and know, hey, if I cross into Georgia, is it going to get cheaper or more expensive? And should right. I fill on this side of the line or the other side? And, and, and that, that tracks kind of the, the, the state tax level. But then there's also apps like Gas Buddy and stuff that will let you look down at the individual stations. Um, in the marine world, uh, the waterway guide has a pretty good guide to to fuel docks and what their prices are. Um, there's also, uh, the along the ICW, the Salty Southeast Cruisers has an app that will download in, instantaneous prices and updates um, and just do a little bit of research so you can know in advance, like, should I fuel up now? Should I fuel up 100 miles from now? Yep. And if you have a larger RV or boat with huge tanks, uh, you actually have more fuel range than you might be used to in a vehicle or even like a, a smaller RV, like a van conversion. Right. Or if you're pulling with a truck or a mm-hmm. uh, uh, SUV sort of a vehicle, you have more range that you can safely go and you can go further along your route and, and save the fuel up for where it's cheaper. Mm-hmm. If you're stationary or you have a smaller fuel tank, you kind of your, your options are more limited and more localized. Yeah. Is it doesn't make sense to go too far out of your way to get cheap fuel, um, because that's just you're spending fuel to, to get fuel. You got to really work that balance. But if you think ahead and plan the spots that are really on your route, then you, it actually makes a ton of sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, the ways you can save money is uh, when RVing, uh, using a credit card, pay for your fuel with credit cards that have fuel rewards on them. It's a great way to get some cash back. Uh, there are some fuel perks, like if you go with Loves and Flying J. We've typically found, however, that their starting price is higher than what you can get at other stations, even with their discounts put in. So the savings really aren't that great. Right. 
And then in the, the Marine world, there's uh, um, discounts for being members of various organizations. So Like the AGLCA, the MTOA, some of the other boating organizations, right. you act, or, uh, Boat US, our uh, emergency right. towing service. Right, so, so check the discounts listed. Because a lot of fuel stations have sometimes pretty substantial, like you know, 10, 15, 20 cents a gallon discounts. Um, and, and another thing is there are volume discounts, and sometimes if you get 200 gallons or 500 gallons, or if you've got a really big boat, 1,000 gallons, you can really save a lot if you're buying that much at once. We've also found that now in boating, there's less stations to fill up at as right. compared to a vehicle has access to. So there's less options, a little less competition sometimes. But we've also found that at some marinas or even just docks that you can go to, you can actually schedule to have the fuel truck come right to you and you're buying at those bulk prices. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've actually had fuel ups and save like 20, 30 cents over what the marina prices might be. Yeah, they just park the truck, roll the hose down the dock. Some, you know, make sure the marina allows this mm -hmm. before you book a truck to come. But actually quite a few marinas that don't have their own fuel docks have a partnership with a fuel truck service. And sometimes they try to bunch together uh, different residents in the marina. So they have a like an extra bulk order if 10 people mm -hmm. go in on one fuel truck delivery. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool ways to save on a boat. I mean, because when you're only getting one and a half to two <laughs> miles to the gallon, you're looking for you any really, way to really save. factor that in. <laughs> All right. Fluctuations. I got a... Hey. So a lot of people, especially when prices are rising, uh, you know, things cause prices to rise from the economy to supply and demand uh, to tax rate changes to just fuels changes and we've you'll, seen you'll the prices we have seen prices all over the map on our 12 years on the road we have just gotten into the mindset of we just go with the flow because when you look at the number of miles that you're covering in a year versus the actual impact on our monthly or annual costs it's not hugely significant um so we actually have this fuel fluctuation calculator and you can go download a copy of this spreadsheet that you see here uh, technomadia.com slash fuel calc and just download that i got instructions in there on how to download it and save it to your own google drive but uh, you just type in the number of miles per year that you travel the mile per gallon and then it will show you um, what the impact is to your annual budget so let's say prices fluctuate by a quarter well, on an annual basis, that's 179 bucks in our RV, um, and our boat, using about 500 miles, it's 63 dollars a year. So, yeah, a quarter change. No one likes to pay more for something that they paid for last week or last month, but in the grand scheme of things, 63 dollars a year is like ordering two less pizzas a year. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is it is nothing to really stress about, and people get really stressed about you know, saving a nickel or a dime sometimes. And if they were just to, to, to dial it back and just think, how significant is that really? It's not not always worth stressing about. And then thank you, Joe, for being our link wizard tonight. <laughs> Sending, <laughs> he's putting the links in the chat room for oh, us. Nice. So appreciate awesome. that, Joe. Um, and you know, obviously, if prices go up a dollar a gallon, eh, you're starting to, to really push the needle there. On, and, and, and you're probably going to start making some considerations and adjusting your pace. Figure out a way to, to, to stick a sail on top of our boat, perhaps. And, and I'm probably <laughs> switching to boxed wine instead of nicer uh, <laughs> bottled wines. But if they go up to $4 a gallon. Uh, yeah, that's going to really impact the cruising kitty. But there's ways to adjust the costs. So feel free to go get a copy of that uh, spreadsheet and do the math on your fuel costs. Uh, those are there just for examples. But that, to me, when I did that, that cost analysis there of what the actual impact is to the bottom line, when I'm considering a fuel station that's 10 cents cheaper but might be more difficult to get our RV into, it's like, you know what? That 10 cent savings just isn't worth the aggravation of trying to squeeze the RV and possibly getting pinned in. Yeah, and, and, and definitely keep that in mind for both RVs and boats because sometimes the cheap fuel is a challenge to get to. You might have to be risk running aground or you might have to maneuver into really, really tight, sketchy circumstances. Um, and in our bus, we've, we, we have just out of necessity gone into some really, really dicey, tight spots to get fuel. Mm -hmm. And 
I would have happily said, here, here's an extra 10 cents a gallon, 20 cents a gallon, yeah. if I didn't have to deal with backing out yeah. of this spot. Yeah. When we're filling the, the bus, which usually about 80 gallons is what we're filling up, because that's about the level that we're comfortable with. It's a 120, 140 gallon tank, but I never like to go too close to empty, because what if you can't find a station? <laughs> uh, same with the boat. We hardly ever let the bus, the boat go much below half tank, because we always want to be have fuel and, range. Yeah, and fuel stops are much further apart, mm -hmm. so... So we're only filling up usually about half or less of our reserve. And so when we're doing that, a 10 cents savings by stressing ourselves out isn't, that, that's like what, eight bucks? Like, you know what? Yep. I, I'm very thankful that we don't have to, you know, we don't yeah. have to. If we were we buying a thousand gallons at a time, a that, huge that would start to change, but yes. <laughs> all right. So I think that's all that we had planned for the fuel cost portion of this. Hopefully that helps some of you who are, trying to wrap your minds around the budget items of cruising or RVing or giving people who are giving you a, a bunch of gruff Grief, about it. Yes. I can't tell you how many comments we've gotten over the years of, oh my gosh, you have to be rich to do what you're doing. I'm and like, how can you stand to live in a rig that gets seven, eight miles a gallon? And uh, wouldn't you rather get 20? Well, I, I would rather get 20, but in the amount of travel that we're doing, it actually wouldn't make a huge, huge difference. And we've had a lot of people ask, well, why don't you invest in doing a hybrid motor or engine system in both and either the rv or the boat it's like okay well let me look at what my actual fuel costs are for the year now mm. geek points aside geek points I, would be I would awesome do it for geek points. and if somebody wants to do a help us with a conversion to electric propulsion <laughs> that'd be super cool but, but yes. <laughs> when i look at the fuel cost savings it would take a decade no probably a century for us to realize the fuel cost savings for the expense of a project like, like that, that. Yes. so really it's not that big of a deal overall annually fuel is just such a small budget item in the things we do we spend more on wine than we do yeah. on and what about fuel for uh, things like our mini cooper and our dinghy how do the, those are still pretty small numbers too right right so our dinghy which is right out the back there you might be able to see it through that window yeah remote camera oh yay there it is there's our dinghy <laughs> uh, we have a four-stroke suzuki gas engine on it it gets about 30 gallons to the nautical mile we have filled the tank twice maybe twice in the year that we've owned it and it cost us 18 dollars yeah so it's dinghy fuel a, is a rounding error um again it's a pizza um the mini cooper that we tow behind our bus and we also do have it here in florida and we sometimes will hopscotch it with us up the coast if we're going to be places long enough um, it gets about 35 to 40 miles to the gallon on the highway and of course a little less when just tooling around town but we don't typically when we have it we're putting on less than 500 miles a month on it yeah but and and that actually comes in that has a bigger overall impact is the fuel economy of a toad often for our viewers is if you've got a big truck like people with fifth wheels that you're getting you know 12 miles a gallon all the time for your daily driver that can really add up a lot uh, particularly if you're doing a lot of errands or playing tourist, as opposed to having a really fuel efficient get around vehicle like a Mini Cooper or a lot, a lot of other people focus on that for their toads. That's that's a good area to put more effort into is fuel efficiency for your get around vehicle as opposed to for mm -hmm. moving your house around. Big, big uh, consideration between going with a large towable that requires that Ford 350 to pull that's going to yeah. be getting horrible fuel economy all the time versus what well, I'm glad we we settled on a, a large motorhome that gets sucky fuel economy and then <laughs> a fuel efficient toad and then a fuel efficient toad which is where we put most of our miles right. on yep. so because actually when we lived in the trailer we had a, a jeep and the, our first jeep was only getting you know uh, 12 miles a gallon 14 miles a gallon no the first jeep uh well yeah. the second jeep well we got yeah, the, the diesel second jeep, jeep the diesel jeep was fuel efficient yes yeah, when we got the, and that's the one that we traveled the most in with our, our trailers um it was getting 18 miles a gallon when towing and 26 when not so that was great that was great but we had compromises in having very small living spaces <laughs> that was only sustainable for us for a yeah. while and then the gas jeep we had before that had horrible fuel economy while towing and yeah. Yes. All right. We are. Um, that wraps up the presentation portion. We are happy to field some questions from you guys. Uh, our Patreons will be joining us for the after party. But uh, as you're queuing up questions in the chat screen, we <laughs> actually have a request oh. of you. Okay. Here we go. We're going to confess. Okay. Here. Some of you may know that we're we're kind of nerdy geeks, and uh, for the past two years, we have been playing Pokemon Go. If you are a fellow Pokemon Go player, <laughs> our current mission 
ta research task by Professor Willow is we have to find new friends. So if you are playing and you need new friends, please friend us. And yeah, we need three new friends each. And um, hey, you know, if you're not playing, just ignore this little geek moment. But we had kind of fun with it. And we like it as a great excuse to go out and explore neighbors because it has little dots on them of cool places to go. We end up start walking towards the pokey dots. And we yesterday we discovered a cool neighborhood and had a great restaurant that we never would have found if we hadn't been just following little dots on a map. But we enjoy Pokemon. <laughs> uh, it does get us out being active. And all the stops that you go to are usually historical markers and points of interest. So it gets us out exploring things. And it's fun. We love gaming. Yep. Um, but we've been really enjoying the friend aspect of it because you pick up these gifts in places that you're visiting and it sends your friends a postcard every day so you can see where we're at and get a greeting from us every day and we can get one from you. So if you're playing Pokemon, please friend us. And we have no idea how many people are actually going to say yes to this. So we have no idea how many people will actually be able to send postcards to, but hey, we'll it's do our best. We'll it is fun. It. We have been fun. enjoying it. Yep. Anyway, let's get back to, um, okay. to, to the non geek stuff. All right. Okay. So yeah, uh, I think there were a couple of uh, questions that were asked. Okay. Uh, someone had asked, how do we get uh, our camping fees down to $600 a month? Oh, here it is. Um, they said that they're newbies and they paid $100 a night in Florida. The best we did was paying 55 to stay in a tent site in their camper van. So tip number one, <laughs> don't stay in RV yeah. parks. When, when you say, and also per night, is when you're doing it per night, that is the worst. I mean, that that is the super expensive way to stay. Once you start to go to monthly prices and places that cater to monthly, that's where you find really cheap prices. That gets done, but you're still going to be paying somewhere between $400, $800 a month right. for a monthly RV spot. Now, when we're RVing, we don't often do monthly stays. We maybe will do one a year, mm -hmm. maybe. maybe. Maybe two sometimes. But, but we love state parks. Now, when you stay in state parks in a lot of states, you're getting the cost down to somewhere between $15 and $30 a night, and mm -hmm. you're staying in places with amazing space around you. There's a two-week limit on those sorts of stays. Um, we also love Harvest Hosts, uh, which is a, a program you join for like, I think it's $49, $49 a year. $49 a year, right. Um, and we actually have a 10% discount code uh, on that cost log page uh, where we yeah. share our monthly costs. There's a 10% discount code on there. Um, and that gets you access to overnight at wineries, breweries. Hey, we hate that. Yeah. Um, uh, museums, museums, even. You know, we've stayed over at a car museum, an uh, air and space mm -hmm. museum, and all these things. It's free places to overnight. Now you are expected to buy something from the place that you're yeah, going. Or, or and, take a tour. Mm -hmm, or a and, but it's a great way to mix it in. There's uh, driveway surfing with friends and family. There's a boondockers welcome, which if you don't have friends and family with driveways, uh, these are people that open their driveways up to RVers and you can stay with them. And then there's a boondocking, boondocking, uh, going out into public land in various places where you can stay for free, which we, we really, really love doing that. Just not because it's for free. We Some of the best places we've stayed, cost aside, are out in the deep desert, or we've even found boondocking spots in Florida. Yes, there's uh, the wildlife management areas in Florida. Yeah. Um, you do have to get a permit in advance, but they're usually free. And then you can stay overnight on these amazing areas. Um, Passport America is the discount club that we use when we do need to stay in commercial RV parks. Mm -hmm. and. There's usually restrictions and you know a limit to how many nights you can stay in them, but they give you 50% off of the rack rate, right. which so, brings those costs way down. Yeah, so if you've got a place that's 70 or $60 a night, an expensive place, Passport America, if you're passing through, you might get three days at $30 a night. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, look at that cost log, uh, technomadia.com slash cost log, and uh, we actually list in there in the uh, campground area some ways to save money. Um, let's see. Anything else here? Okay, yeah. So, so, I, I think I, I, when we're talking about the dinghy, I said 30 gallons to the mile. No, it's 30 miles to <laughs> yeah, the we, gallon. We don't have the world's most inefficient dinghy. That, that'd be just dumping fuel off the back. I don't even think we could spill it that fast. <laughs> All right, yeah. All right, so. Let's see. I wish we could have somebody highlight the questions. Yeah, I wish so. Yeah, there is a way to highlight questions in the chat box, but it makes you guys pay for it, and I'm not, I'm not cool with that. Because, yeah. Uh, Lots of great comments here, right. which is awesome. Swimmy Swim Swim asks, how many watts worth of solar panels are you planning? Oh, um, all I'm of them. All <laughs> of them, yeah. Yes, yes. I'm assuming you're asking about the boat. Right. We have 800 watts on the roof of the bus, and then we have 600 watts of flat panels in the bus that we can put out on the ground. So we can get up to 1,400 watts on the bus. 
um, on the boat. We have mapped out a plan that could get us up to, was it 2,400 watts? I think so. I'm not sure we'll go that route yeah, or not. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure we actually need that much. Yeah, so so we're, we're, we still have to, we, we were about to, this time last year, we were finalizing the solar plan for the boat, and we're about to have the parts all start coming together and then a hurricane happens so we haven't really gotten back to revisiting and starting again on that solar plan so michael says he uses a national park pass for 80 dollars per year it allows you free camping in millions of acres of blm national forest on the lands and that is not true you do not need the national park pass to get the free camping on national forest and blm that is open to everybody right. and it's two weeks at a time what the national park pass does is it, it uh, exempts your admission fees to the national parks that charge a daily or weekly admission fees um, and right. if you are I think it's 65, I think is the age limit, or you are a disabled veteran, you can get a national park pass for really cheap and you can get 50% off of paid campgrounds at national parks. Right, and also any, any place there's a concessionaire basically. Right, but uh, to do the free camping on national lands, you do not need a park pass, right. unless there's an admission fee yeah. to get in. Or there's like the long-term visitor area LTVAs, fees. Yeah, so they there have are a, some, some of those, yes. and that's like $180 for six months. Yeah, but the national park pass doesn't help you with that. Okay. We have JP, John P. asked, since dockage doesn't seem overly expensive on sign site, would you opted for a slightly larger, longer boat? And we actually did get the larger boat. Um, yes. We <laughs> originally were looking at a 38 to 42 footers, which is would have been our ideal size. And we ended up with a 47 footer. Um, so we already did go larger and I'm completely happy with the size. Yeah, and I, I don't think we'd want any bigger. This has been a good sweet spot size for us. We feel like we have plenty of space. Um, with a boat, unlike an RV, with a boat you pay by the foot in most of the places that you're going if you're getting a dock. So there's there's good reasons to optimize for smaller, but you don't want to go too small and compromise. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the, for this pace that we're going at, uh, the uh, Bayliner 4788 that we ended up on has been just a extremely comfortable little floating condo for us, uh, both at anchor and in marinas. And I kind of like that we're usually in marinas. We're not the largest and we're not the smallest. Oops. Oh, no, just the camera shift, the remote camera shifted a little bit. Okay. Yep. Uh, the Die Master says, have you thought of using PF Sense box to automatically find the best, fastest internet? Um, we've usually there's, there's, manual testing involved uh, the the we do have routers that can try all the different combinations and try and pick amongst them but uh, usually experience and just a little bit of testing manually is much better smarter and more efficient than any sort right. of automation we've ever run across so i'm seeing a couple questions about uh, mobile internet and that is actually our day job right uh, and we have an entire resource center at uh, mobileinternetinfo.com and we have a dedicated youtube channel to the topic uh, it's mobile internet resource center if you want to go subscribe to that but i would recommend heading over to uh, mobileinternetinfo.com slash overview and that is our starter guide to the options and the current best plans that we are tracking so if you've got questions on mobile internet go there we had a comment from Miv Mivnyana about boondocking is great, but then you need to find places to dump. And one of our tricks for that is actually that's where we find Passport America super useful. So we'll go boondock for two weeks. We'll find a nearby Passport America park, go stay for one or two nights at half price so it's dirt cheap. And we call it sleeping at the dump tank. So we will, uh, at the dump station, we will, we will dump and um, flush our tanks. We will do all our laundry. We'll refill our water tanks. And then we'll head back into the desert fully refreshed, and we would have only spent you know, basically a pittance to, to do that. Yep, that's yep. a great thing that we do. And then you can find dump stations. Some, yeah. some uh, rest stops have them, some uh, fuel stations yeah. have them, especially those in areas where there's yeah. a lot of RV traffic. And, and the fee you're paying for the long-term visitor, if you want to boondock out in the desert southwest for extended, extended periods of time, the, the permit fee includes access to a dump station as well. So, you know, there, there's definitely ways to do the mm -hmm. dumping. Right. So, uh, Christopher asks, uh, are you going to go do lithium batteries for your boat? And uh, check Stay back with us in about two weeks. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Our Patreons will be getting yeah. a sneak peek here very oh, soon about what we're doing. We're not quite doing. ready to be reveal it publicly yet, though. Um, Alan asks, what navigation system are you using? What systems would you rec recommend for a lifelong late boater who would like to do the loop? Um, I can only share what we picked, and uh, we're not lifelong boaters. We <laughs> had an inflatable kayak before we had our boat. But okay, so so for the chart plotters in the boat, we have a Garmin system, but we actually do most of our navigation and planning using the Navionics app on an iPad. 
And the Navionics app is such a fabulous app and it's a great bargain. I definitely recommend that. And then there's also Aqua Maps US um, is also really fabulous. So having a good chart plotter system and then pick two. I I'd, I'd always go with two, at least two iPad apps so you can compare the features between them, compare the routes, compare the charts. Um, and then you're set and good to go. And yeah. That's yeah. And we went all Garmin on our Marine Electronics package, plotters, which yeah. we are overdue for doing a tour of. Yep. I have a video produ production list that seems to never <laughs> end. Um, Pokemon Go friends request coming. Yay. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, RV Fishing says they've heard about Boondockers Welcome, but they haven't signed up. Have we used it? We personally have not used it. And the only reason for that is, is we typically have, because of our presence on social media, we usually have a whole list of invitations already that we can't, that um, usually we don't have time to take advantage of already, never mind. And it's yeah. very, we have not yet been somewhere where we need to seek a, a driveway to stay in yeah, but we, we we know the people behind mm -hmm. boondockers welcome and we know a lot of people who use it regularly and have had wonderful experiences and wonderful things to say that's yeah. yeah it's great we are members of it we do support them and yes. maybe one day it'll turn out we need to be someplace where there aren't other options and we'll seek it out um, i'm personally more comfortable being invited being someone reaching out and inviting us to stay in their driveway than i am asking someone to i'm right personal comfort level um, Even though they've put the invitation in the yeah. form of a boondockers welcome entry, you know, we, we still like the like personal the invite. invites. Yeah. Okay, so Chris, here's a question for you. Some questions about the new Mavic Pro or Zoom. So the new drone is out. Chris has been pretty much watching videos on trying to decide which one we're going to be ordering today, tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Oh, the, they're very lusty. The the new Mavic 2. Um, the, the, the one thing I'm upset with them about is that they made two versions of it. And so you've got to choose between the zoom lens and the, the hyper resolution uh, stitching or the super one inch sensor. And overall, I mean, I was so I've been so impressed with the Mavic that the Mavic 2 is just going to be more of the same plus better. So, yeah, the, Ma the Mavic, when I first got it, was kind of gave me an Apple-like experience of, like, wow, just works. Is, yeah, mm -hmm. well, and this is, the technology is just so polished. It was so far ahead of any other drones we'd looked at. So which at. one are you leaning? What are you going to get? I'm probably leaning to the, the, the Pro, just for the better um, um, low-light photography and... Um, yeah, but it's tough to decide. <laughs> <laughs> Choices, they make uh -huh. it to make it difficult. Yep. <laughs> All right. And buy okay. both is what they want. No, I, I can't buy. <laughs> Joe, if you want to buy us one, that's great. Yeah. I know. Which one are you going to get, Joe? I know. Are you going to be upgrading yeah. yours? <laughs> no, Cherie's Sh already said she wants the old Mavic to, so she can start droning simultaneously and we'll have little drone offs in the sky. And this will. So, yeah, that'll be fun. <laughs> uh, Santa wants to know, is there anything available out there to increase, increase gas mileage? I'm assuming in an RV. Or boats. Gravity going down a hill really can do wonders, actually. I, yeah. I recommend like a nice long, not too steep of a hill. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, if you can find those, a, a constant downhill yeah. across the whole country, if that's you, If you perfect. start in Flagstaff and go down to Phoenix, downhill the whole way, you have a great fuel economy. Um, uh, obviously, <laughs> reducing the weight of your, your, your RV or, or boat as much as possible. The more weight you have, the more your engines have to burn to push. It's does make some difference it's, is it going to be huge um oh, well and the, the biggest thing you can do is actually just drive slower too that makes a, the difference the difference in fuel consumption between 65 miles an hour and 55 miles an hour is huge because that's right about the point where wind resistance particularly on something like an rv starts to logarithmically mm -hmm. pile up and if you can you know coast into the slow lane or, or take more back roads mm -hmm. and stuff avoid stop and go because stop and go is horrible for fuel economy but if you can find ways to lower your cruise speed and on a boat too makes a huge difference mm -hmm. um, um yeah. when we rebuilt our engine on our bus it's a detroit diesel two-stroke 8b71 uh, we actually went with smaller fuel injector sizes i think it had in 70s or 75s when we took it apart and we went with it's been a few years i think they're in 65s uh so that we're actually using less fuel yeah we, I, gave, we, we gave up a little bit of horsepower mm -hmm. but um better fuel economy but uh, so we did that uh, long term and we actually did see now how much was it the fuel injectors versus how much was 
uh, it just having the engine rebuilt mm -hmm. it's really hard to gauge there's like absolutely no feedback whatsoever on an old Detroit diesel engine but we went from averaging 6.8 miles to gallon to we get I would say more like 7.3 I think is our overall since mm -hmm. we did the engine rebuild so definitely we've seen a fuel increase since that cool. I think we're caught up on questions here all right. We've done 40 minutes. This has been good. It's good length for the archive. So thank you for joining us. Um, if you want advanced notification of our future live chat videos, our Patreons get uh, in the know the moment that we decide to do one of these. So they get the announcement. They got the announcement. I think Friday is when we decided to do this. We don't often give a lot of advance notice. Um, and if you've enjoyed these videos and you don't feel like becoming a Patreon. Um, no pressure. No pressure at all. Uh, we do these for fun. But if you would like to say thank you, we do have a leave a tip button on every page of technomadia.com. You'll find it down in the bottom of every single page. Uh, we always appreciate that. That goes directly into the wine and dine and entertainment fund. And the drone toy fund. Too. And the, yeah. droid, the drone. If you like the drone videos, you can help fund the, dr the drone for Chris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do appreciate those. Um, oh yeah, definitely. If you like our videos, comment. Um, even if you're watching the archive, we'd still love to hear your comments. If you have questions for us, we will do our best yeah. to answer them later. Yeah. And 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 if by liking videos, that's kind of a vote to YouTube's algorithms to share them with more people, which is is great. Brings more people into the channel and watching and stuff. Which our yeah. goal isn't to grow the channel, but hey, meeting more cool people that's, is that so is our goal. That works. So, so yes. that is our goal. So, uh, anything else? No. I guess I'll just switch them to the remote sunset camera view then. All right, guys, thanks for joining in. We've had fun. Our Patreons, we'll see you at the after party here at, <laughs> uh, in about 30 minutes. And yeah, there, there's a little bit of sunset light back there. We're, this is experimenting with a remote wireless camera that we'll be able to play with in future broadcasts. So cool, fun stuff. See you guys. Good night. And thank you, Joe, our awesome <laughs> moderator. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Oh, Kiki didn't get a... a oh, oh, okay. Hey, let, let's put the, cam the remote camera into cat cam mode. No, she's sleeping. Okay. One final shot of Kiki. He was napping. Hey. Oh. <laughs> there. Hi, Kiki. Okay. You hold the camera on the cat, and that will fade us out. All right. Hey, Kiki, <laughs> do you have anything to say to your fans? Oh, goodness. Cat cam. Okay. We're, we're stopping this now. <laughs>